Paul, let me start with you. Uh, this guy had a criminal record. He was well known to authorities. Was this an intelligence failure? Well, to some degrees, uh, yes. I mean, seven years ago, he was writing all these letters uh, to the families of Australian servicemen who, who were killed uh, in action. Very, very radical letters back in 2007. So he's been doing this for some time. He's been on the radar screen for some time. Just last month, he pledged allegiance to the head of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, online. So this is a guy with some form when it comes to radical extremism. And yet, I guess, David, what do you do until he actually carries out? I mean, you, you see him in these, in these clips uh, holding up, you know, sandwich boards on the street. He looks like just a crackpot. Yeah, that's one of the difficulties of going after lone wolf terrorists, that you can't conspire with yourself. And so they have to have done something illegal to prosecute them for an act of terrorism. But there's two things you can do that the United States has utilized, one of which is sting operations, basically see what somebody's intentions are by giving them the opportunity to act out a fantasy scenario. Controversial, but they do deal with the problem. A second thing is utilizing other pegs that you have, kind of an Al Capone style of policing. Al Capone, of course, was a notorious bootlegger. He killed people, but he was uh, ultimately convicted of tax evasion. And uh, in this case, there may, might have been pegs like the immigration system, especially given the assault charges and the murder charge against him. Right. I would think that those could have been used. Um, uh, then, Paul, also, I, I would think in this day and age of social media and the proliferation of really powerful propaganda by these terrorist groups online, it's very difficult to go after uh, these lone wolves. You have uh, instructions uh, in Inspire magazine on how to uh, build a, a bomb. You have uh, all these slick videos from ISIS. It must make it much more complicated. That's right. You don't necessarily need to go to a training camp anymore to get the kind of information you might need to build explosive devices. You can just go and, and, and buy a, a weapon. You know, one big question will be, how did this guy manage to get hold of a weapon That's right, in Australia? He was banned. on the radar screen right. of the intelligence services there. That's one of the biggest questions today. And guns were banned in Australia, of course. What lesson can we learn, David? Is there anything we can see uh, in this instance in Sydney? I know it's, it's early yet. That, that American intelligence officials or national security officials can say, this is what we need to do to prevent that from happening here. I, I think one of the most important things I'd look at is not just this attack, but the pattern of attacks that have some sort of ISIS inspiration this year. If you count the beheading in Oklahoma, there's six of them. The, you know, the two in Canada, the New York City axe attack, um, this attack among them. And uh, in general, there's about, uh, over the past decade, there's been about 72 lone wolf attacks for all kinds of lone wolf terrorism across 15 different western states. This year there's been six for ISIS-inspired lone wolf terrorism alone. I think one lesson is that social media, uh, in my view, is effective uh, in taking that group function which normally exists in terrorism, that is people egging each other on, and it can apply to lone wolves. And so uh, my concern, and I think what, what law enforcement should have in mind, is that the, the pattern of lone wolves and the pace of them may be increasing. All right, David, Paul, thank you so much. Appreciate it.